Um, now I would like to introduce our first speaker, John Hatzis, um, Senior Software Developer at EAM RFID Solutions. He'll be talking about RFID-enabled vest, improved visibility, and traceability. All right. Good morning, good morning. Uh, I always get that, uh, it seems like I always get the, the, the shift right before lunch when everybody's kind of thinking about what they're going to be eating, so I'll try to, try to keep you awake. Uh, and get you out to lunch as quickly as possible. But well, we are going to be talking about RFID today in harsh environments. I'm going to talk about several things. Now, I do work for EAM RFID Solutions. That's a subdivision of my parent company, EAM Worldwide. But I'm not going to talk to you from the standpoint of RFID Solutions. I'm going to talk to you from the standpoint of EAM Worldwide and, and how the implementation helped us originally, how we kind of got into it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are. Um, our company, before we got into RFID, uh, the existing infrastructure that we had before we put in RFID and some of the challenges uh, that that infrastructure gave us. Uh, the goals, which were internal as well as external. Um, some of the options we looked at when we, before we even implemented RFID, uh, the choices we could have went through. The solution we chose, how we did the implementation and the challenges to that implementation, and what were the results and what is next for us. So. Um, a little bit about EAM Worldwide. Oop, there I went. <laughs> a little bit about EAM Worldwide. Uh, we're an OEM of aviation safety equipment. Uh, we've been in business over 60 years, and we did end up, as a result of the success that we had with RFID, we ended up actually starting an RFID division, and that's the division I now work for, EAM RFID Solutions. So to give you perspective on EAM Worldwide, uh, we're based out of uh, Miami. We have uh, sales headquarters in Dubai. Today, 48% of the world's life vests are produced and manufactured at EAM. So we've been around a while, and we have a really, really strong market share. Uh, we just opened up a new division, the slides. Uh, we're not RFIDing the slides yet, but we are RFIDing every single life vest that comes out of EAM Worldwide, whether the client wants it or not. Uh, and then we also do life rafts, and we're not currently doing those but with RFID, but by, by customer request, we actually will. Now, uh, as I like to refer to kind of like the dark years for EAM Worldwide or EAM Worldwide BT, um, before technology, EAM Worldwide for us without RFID was a a mess. It was organized chaos as far as manufacturing goes. I mean, we literally, from the moment we cut the silk screen to the end when we had the final product, we had horrible visibility. We, we didn't know where we were at in manufacturing orders. We had location issues, all kinds of stuff, and I'm going to get into that. Now, the existing infrastructure that we had was a large facility, 56,000 square foot. Uh, we had a worldwide distribution and repair network, so it's not just about visibility at a, at a location. It's also within our network. We had internally a manual stamping and card system. So we're producing thousands of vests a day, and we're literally using manual stamping and administrative tasks out of the dark ages. Our existing ERP, it relied on manual entry for every asset we had, and they were all serialized. Every, every life vest, every raft, everything that we were producing was serialized, and manual entry is just ridiculous for that. Um, we had multiple stations within the facility, all of them working on face-to-face -face communication as far as understanding where a manufacturing order is at within the process, any issues that are going on, uh, where we're out as far as delivery and, and shipment, um, and things like uh, inspection process as well. All of this stuff, the communication literally had to be done face to face. Now the challenges obviously were lack of visibility. And all these challenges are gonna be challenges that whether you're manufacturing, whether you're in distribution, whether you're uh, uh, in retail or whatever it is, these are gonna be similar challenges that you're gonna face uh, no matter what business you have. So lack of visibility, where are we at? with our manufacturing process um, and what, how long is it taking certain products to get from point, point A to point B. 
We had manual administration inspection issues. Because we are a manufacturer of safety equipment for the, for the aviation industry, we have strict guidelines, obviously, brought down on us by the FAA. So we had inspection processes throughout our facility and we were doing that with manual visual inspections, filling out manual cards saying Life Vest 142203 was inspected by Inspector 32 and they put their little stamp on it. Labor overhead. Obviously when you're using any type of manual administrative processes, you've got overhead issues. You have people doing arbitrary tasks or tasks that that are taking up time and they could be better used in other parts of the facility. We had packing errors. Um, we're packing 40 life vests in a box. We're pumping out thousands of these things a day and they're all identical and we have people putting them into boxes, right? And if a box was supposed to have 49, maybe this box got 41, maybe it got 39. It's getting to the end customer we're upsetting the end customer. We're either overpacking, underpacking. It, just a bad situation there. We had location issues. Um, one of the big issues for us as a manufacturing plant for life vests was if we have a life vest go through the process, we cut the silk screen, right? We have it going from station to station and we get it down to the end station where it's supposed to be inspected and it fails inspection, we have to send that one particular life vest back into the process, back to the station in which maybe it's a whistle or whatever it is, get it repaired, send it back through the process and it has to be inspected. Well, the problem with that is if we have a manufacturing order or multiple manufacturing orders going on in one day, and we have identical life vests being sent through the process, right? And I've got to now reinspect that one life vest on manufacturing order 1423, right? That has to be hung up on a wall now and inflated. How do I find that one life vest? It's like finding a needle in a stack of needles, right? And we were able to address that with RFID. So how do you find your assets? How long is it? It's not just finding your assets, but how long is it taking to get from station A to station B or C, and where are those bottlenecks within our own processes, whether you're manufacturing or distribution, and how can we address those? And RFID really, really uh, addressed that and allowed us to understand our own processes and improve them and remove those bottlenecks. Now, whenever you have a technology implementation, you, be, you should be thinking what are your goals internally and what are your goals externally. For us, we had internal goals. Obviously, we wanted to optimize the processes. We had tasks that would be done manually, human labor that can be done more efficiently and we can have our most important asset, people, doing the things that matter to us most. We wanted to reduce overhead, obviously. We wanted to increase capacity. We had a 56,000 square foot facility, but our demand was growing. Our market share was growing. How do you produce more in the same square footage? And, and that was one of the challenges. That's one of the goals that we set forth with RFID. We figured if we can implement RFID in the right way and reduce the bottlenecks, have less people doing the same tasks, and yet producing more capacity could meet that demand. We definitely wanted to eliminate packing errors. And RFID, this is probably the one area which almost completely addressed the issue 100%. Our packing errors now are less than 0.02%. We wanted to streamline inspections. For us, we had inspection tables where we have inspectors looking at each vest uh, with a, a uh, visual inspection. They still have to do that now. But inspection cards had to be placed with each asset. And on that inspection card, it had to have serial number, 
part number, the inspector, when it was inspected. It had to be stamped. So we wanted to address that. We also wanted to offer greater value to our clients from an internal standpoint, not from the, the external. We wanted to be able to improve our customer service ratings with our end, end, end uh, customer. And we wanted to do that with RFID. Now we had external goals. Now obviously being an aviation company, uh, aviation based safety equipment, uh, they directly related to the airlines. We wanted to have the airlines be able to reduce maintenance check times within their cabin safety equipment. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Airlines right now are faced with an extremely daunting task. You've got a, let's say, a, a 777 with 300 seats on it. You got 300 life vests. They are supposed to be inspecting those life vests to number one, make sure that they're there, right? Because their clients, their customers like to take souvenirs home. They also have to make sure they're not expired. Okay? And imagine checking 300 seats, right? And you're wanting to get your bird in the air, and you've got people cleaning the plane, doing standard maintenance all through one aisle or two aisles, whatever it is. Imagine trying to go under every seat, pull out a life vest, and look to see what the expiration date is. Just even making sure it's there was a task. With RFID, we addressed that for them. We wanted to be able to comply with TSA security checks, valid information, knowing letting the airlines actually address the fact that if those uh, life vests have been tampered with. And obviously we wanted to comply with FAA regulations. The most obvious one that RFID addresses is we wanted to give them the greater ability to understand their own inventory control. We're talking about one plane that might have 300 life vests on a smaller plane, 140, 150, plus their backup life vests. Um, and then also we do the rafts and the slides as well as safety kits. So we had these goals in mind. Um, they actually, the goals ended up growing as we were doing this. So we had a, a, a set uh, group of goals. Maybe it didn't include all of these. But as we started going through the pilot with RFID, those goals grew. Now, when we were considering what to do about our internal problems and the external goals, we had a couple of options, right? We had RFID to look at, and we had barcode, which has been around for decades. But the problem with, with barcode was the, the line of sight was an issue, right? For us, we could have probably used it internally, but with barcode, you have this line of sight requirement. So you have to actually see the barcode and scan it. Well, that doesn't really help the airlines because they don't want to have to get up underneath the seats and, and scan those life vests, you know, line of sight. Plus, for us in inspections wise, we didn't want to be limited to having to have our employees scan them line of sight. With RFID, we were able to utilize portable databases that could scan the tags simultaneously, which you just can't do with RFID, I mean with uh, barcode. With RFID, you're able to scan hundreds of tags, and you can literally do that on a mobile reader, and you can do it within seconds, all simultaneously. And we were empowering the airlines to do that. With barcode, it's right once. There's the barcode. It's on there, and that's it. It has a number, and that's it. With RFID, we had the read and write capabilities. We can now embed the birth information of the asset and allow our end customers to edit the current data record. You just couldn't do that with barcode. This is about harsh environments, and that's, that was the biggest issue for us, is that we're dealing in a manufacturing process, right? So we're talking about life vests that, in, in, uh, depending on which life vest you order from us, it's, it can be vacuum sealed, so crushed up. 
And with a barcode, if you had a barcode on the life vest, it would just be wrinkled up. You wouldn't be able to read it. We needed something that allowed them to understand the asset information about that asset without dealing with the, the harsh environment issues. And also, we needed, we needed something that could have fire resistance. We needed something that could deal with pressure and vibration issues. And we wanted a long read range. We wanted you to be able to read these assets literally just walking down the aisle if you're the end customer in the airlines. For us internally, this was a big one. We wanted the ability to actually track that asset in real time. We wanted to know where our manufacturing, when it comes to sending that order through the manufacturing process, we wanted to know where manufacturing order 42 is within the process. Because we have multiple manufacturing orders going on at the same time, multiple departments. We've got accounting and customer service. They're wanting to know where manufacturing order 42 is because the customer is wanting to know an update on it. So we wanted to understand where each one of those assets are at within the manufacturing process. But you're not going to do that manually. You're not going to say, OK, uh, manufacturing order number 42 with serial number 61324 just went through sewing and then and so on and inspection and whistles and it, you're just not going to do that but if you could automate it right if you could make no human interaction go on just have the assets pass through a read zone and update what part of the the process it's went through that would give you complete visibility and I wouldn't have to use that face-to-face -face communication that we were using prior to, to RFID. So the solution came about. And this is what I was talking about, that, that needle in a stack of needles. Imagine trying to find serial number 14326 in that stack of life vests because you need it because it goes to a specific manufacturing order and it's serialized and you have to have that one life vest. You know what we did? Every single one of those life vests have an RFID tag internal to it. All I do to have to find that one particular life vest is I put in the number of the life vest that I'm looking for. Based on RSSI strength, the strength of the signal from the interrogator to that tag, we can locate the life vest within a few feet and find the exact one. We took a process that we had a manager running around the facility looking for a life vest. And we uh, it could have taken 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to track down one single life vest. And now it takes a few seconds. And it only takes a few seconds because not only do we do that, where we can actually find it on this inspection rack, but we also made a repair station in which any time one of those life vests go back for repair, we scanned it. We scanned the RFID tag, and we, we sent it to the system where it's going back. So we already knew that it was going back for, for um, repair anyway, and we had just a much greater visibility. The vests are tracked through all phases. We, like I said, we know exactly where they're at, and we get those real-time updates, and anyone in the company can pull up any time, any particular serial number and know where it's at. When going through the implementation, bringing something on like RFID is always a challenge. Um, there's a lot of choices to make. It's a huge learning curve. Things like, what tags are you going to use? For us, we use passive tags. Um, passive, I'm sure everybody in here knows, but if you don't, there are basically two, two categories of tags. There's actually three, but in general, there's two. Passive tags and active tags. Passive tags have no battery source. They're more economical. Uh, they lay dormant, and we don't have to worry about the restrictions in that harsh environment of an airplane in worrying about the signal constantly going, which the FAA won't allow. So right now, active tags are not even allowed inside the airplane. So we had to have passive tags. Um, we have fixed and mobile readers. The Fixed readers themselves allow for zero human interaction, so updates without having anybody else involved. And that was huge for us. It gave us that visibility we were looking for. It, it combated that challenge that we had 
of not knowing where things were, not understanding where our problems were as far as bottlenecking that manufacturing process. We also patented the embedding of the RFID, life, uh, RFID chip in our life vest. You, you may ask, well, what does that matter? It matters now when our competitors can't RFI, internally RFID our life, their life vest because we have a patent on it. So I'm telling you this because if you have a product, RFID is the direction that the world's going as far as asset management. So if you have a product that you could you know, get into RFIDing and then patent it, it can also now put you on a competitive advantage. We've done that. We've, uh, we integrated, and this is for EAM RFID solutions, which I'm not really going to talk about today, but we also integrated Edgeware so that our clients can now turn around and utilize that RFID chip that we placed in the asset. So now when they're receiving it into their system, they can receive that entire box of 40 vests without ever opening it. They literally don't have to have an invoice. They don't have to know anything about the information of that particular order. They can scan the entire box and bring it into their system. Manufacturing order, serial number, part number, cage code, all off the asset. And that, that was the power of it. But these were the considerations when we were doing the implementation. The other challenge is when considering something like an RFID implementation, obviously executive buy-in, right? Um, it's all good and well you want to, you say you want to, you're going to bring in this great new technology and we're going to do things better. They want to know how much it's going to cost you and they want to know how you're going to make the money back up. So you better have a good business plan when it comes to executive buy-in because you're going to have to show them, I can get a capacity increase. I can give you greater visibility, but how does that equate to numbers? Well, that equates to numbers because right now we're having issues where one particular area for us in manufacturing, one particular area was backing up other areas. We were limited in our capacity, couldn't meet demand. And that's how we justified it. Another huge challenge, which I think a lot of people never consider, because I talk to people about RFID all the time, is how you're going to adhese the, the, the RFID chip to the asset. And I'm not talking about, for us, we had to have Gorilla Glue ain't, don't have nothing on what we use, by the way, to adhese our RFID chips to the life vest. Imagine, I want you to imagine the environment I work in. We have a material, right, that is not stretched when we place the RFID tag on it. And then we expand it with the RFID tag inside the life vest. And we have to make sure it doesn't come off. The adhesion that we had to use is extreme. We spent one year just on adhesion. The problem was not in the fact of getting it strong enough to stay on the life vest. The problem was that once we did, we were now jamming up the RFID printers. Why? Because the adhesion was coming out off the sides of the tags, and it was now jamming up the RFID printers. And these are the little pitfalls that you're going to run into, the challenges that, that you can befall you when you bring in this technology, and you just got to, you got to stick to it. The ERP integration. We had uh, an existing ERP that isn't exactly the most friendly on allowing you to touch their database table, our, our database tables actually, um, because of the way in which events and triggers are set up on the back end of our ERP system, um, they didn't want us directly editing some of those tables, so that was a challenge, and those are the things you have to consider. Proximity control, another thing that made our environment so hard to really implement RFID was that we wanted inspectors sitting next to each other and across from each other inspecting life vests. And we wanted to make that an automated process, right? We wanted to get rid of that manual uh, administration with the task cards. 
but they're sitting next to each other. I don't want Inspector A's uh, scanner going off when ex Inspector B is inspecting their, their life vest. And we had to address those challenges. And the way we did that was we put some reflective material. We got antennas with short read range, turned the power down, and kept it to about a six inch read range. And they just flopped the life vest up there. It reads without them doing anything, prints the card out, serial number, inspector, the whole thing. But those were the challenges. We were running into that, that they would put the life vest up and the other inspector's reader would pick it up. So you gotta tweak those little things. It, it's a process. Understanding read range, understanding proximity control, and learning how to manipulate it. And then, <laughs> I could go on for hours about FAA regulations, but one of the biggest challenges for us is AS5678. Oh, airlines have this whole big thing about it not being able to burn and set the whole plane on fire and, you know, that whole safety thing. And uh, they got some really tough <laughs> regulations when it comes to what you can put on the asset and how you alter the asset. So we had those different challenges we had to address. Then you got your environmental challenges, things like cabin pressure, uh, the fire resistance, immunity to EMI, because when you're talking about safety equipment, you also got to worry about the data on the RFID chip, right? You, you can't have EMI flipping those bits on the, on the uh, chip and changing the data because it's safety equipment. What is EMI? Electromagnetic interfer interference. And within an airplane, there's quite a bit because you have power running all over the, the plane, uh, communications equipment. But we have tags that are highly, highly uh, resistant to EMI. How, how did you solve that problem? You, that's, that's, you've got to partner up with, with a tag manufacturer that has experience with EMI uh, immunity and have ran tests. We didn't do the tests ourselves, but our partner uh, tag manufacturer does. And we, we, we had to do research before we made a, a choice in tag manufacturer, but that's something you're going to have to consider, without a doubt, uh, it, if those requirements are there, if those challenges are there. An airplane is a tough environment, by the way, because when we brought this program about, the, you know, the, the, the goal was for our clients to have a, a huge advantage. But you're talking about a metal tube with extreme regulations and airlines are worried about weight restrictions. They're worried about costs in every sector. So it, it was challenging to put forth a solution that was cost effective for us, but yet we, see, we went about it as, yes, we have these external goals, but internally, let's meet our challenges. And that's what's gonna pay for it for us. The bonus will be that our clients will be able to use it. And then integration into a highly compact product. Uh, our life vests, depending on which part number you get, they actually can be uh, vacuum packed. So that, that, that chip has to be highly durable and be able to be folded and still be able to read. And we've got, a, we've got tags that do it. So the first phase, we've, we've broken into three phases um, when, when starting the original pilot. Tag commissioning and packing, we attacked the biggest problem area we had, which was the packing, the packing errors, and tag commissioning, which is just the programming of the tag, getting the data onto the tag. So that was phase one. Phase two, uh, we wanted to get in the tracking of it and repair tracking. So tracking of where those assets are at within the manufacturing process, and then when they go back for repair, knowing where they're at and being able to track that and then shipping. We wanted to be able to dock in a manufacturing order and be able to alert customer service that an order is ready to go out without having a human do that. So now we can do that. Literally, when a manufacturing order is staged and, we've, and we have fixed readers scanning that area, we know when that order is complete and ready to go out. So we can now enable that communication with the client. The results. So, we experienced uh, decreases in production time. We reduced human errors by a lot. Packing errors are, it's, I think it's 99.98% last year. I think, I think it was like 
two boxes last year that had the in incorrect number. And the reason for that is that now when they pack a, a box of our vests, they have to pass by a reader. So they literally pass by the reader and drop it into the box, and it keeps a count, and it stops them from packing anymore. So the only way to miscorrect, to mispack a box, is if you just totally ignore this light and a sound that stops you from packing the life vest. We do, actually. We do. But the, 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 the problem is, is that they explained to me that originally, like the whole issue with weighing was that we have model numbers. We, we essentially make a certain set of, of life vests. But yet we have a hundred and something model numbers. And the reason being is that one particular client might have a whistle, one won't. One, and tracking like, and, and like we might get whistles from a different supplier and then the weight be slightly off and you're putting 40 of these on so the weight could differentiate quite a bit, but that's an absolutely valid question. We do weigh now in the, as an automated process with the RFID so they set it up on a scale and actually it weighs at the same time. But there wasn't consistency and I know that sounds crazy but there, there wasn't consistency because of the, the hundreds of part numbers we have. Um, we increased on-time delivery as a result of increasing our capacity. And we almost completely eliminated short shipments, which I was talking about, the packing errors. The production time of life vests was reduced by 30%. 30%. We, I'm sorry? Because we had these bottlenecks in two particular areas. The biggest one, inspection. The, the inspection process before, they had a lot of people and doing manual writing it. I, there were certain processes we could have done without RFID to increase production time. So don't let me fool you and say, we had it. We had processes, improvements that we could have done. We just jumped some of the, the technologies in between what we were doing and RFID. And that's, the bottleneck is, bottlenecks were the biggest deal and things like you'd have a manufacturing order that you had to find, you know, particular vests to a manufacturing order or you had a hold up because one went back in repair and it was just all these different things related to no visibility and poor communication between the uh, departments. Communication was a big issue, but the two things I blame it on was communications and an inspection process. Capacity, that was the biggest increase because now we could just do a lot more in the same square footage. But that was the result of now we took away half the inspection tables. Now, um, in the uh, cutting silk screen process where we put the RFID tag, now that was one person that managed serialization and data entry because all we did was we printed out the RFID tags ahead of time and put them on there. So we, we took away three or four people there and we were able to just speed up that and the capacity went through the roof. But we also, again, we went from Stone Age to Star Wars, you know what I mean? Miscounts and short shipments is almost completely eliminated. On time delivery went up because of the, the capacity increase, production time increase. Our lead times went down for our, for our orders. That's what affected mainly the uh, on time delivery. And we had much better trend analysis. So now we understood which areas were in the manufacturing process took longer. Um, as far as capital, now we could reduce uh, the stock levels because we understood what was going out, we understood our orders, we understood where we were at in the, in the uh, manu manufacturing process. We could reduce the capital expenditures for holding inventory so we didn't have to have as much available. Productivity increased by 40%. 
that's based on the fact that we were able to reduce labor yet increase capacity. And errors significantly reduced through the automated capture um, of the instant double check for picking accuracy. So we're able to now um, get, capture that data without humans being involved. So this is just a graph of what I was saying. Um, and this is right after the pilot was done, 2009. We finished up. And you can see the difference after RFID. So 2009, that's post RFID full implementation after the third phase. And again, the same thing. So what's next for us? Um, we want to tag all our product lines. Uh, one issue that we've, we just come about with evacuation slides and life rafts is there are big assets and producing the value for the client. It doesn't cost us much to throw a tag on one of these assets, but will our client use it? That's kind of the thing. But <clears throat> I think we're going to go ahead and do the entire line. Survival kits are already the process is being put in place. Um, we're also going to, uh, we've, this says designing, implementing, and integrating aviation-specific client software. We already do that uh, with my division. Uh, we sell aftermarket solutions, but I'm not going to talk about that today because I don't want this to be sales pitchy. Um, but that's what our goal is. It worked so well for us that we said, you know, after, after the results, we said we can, we can help other businesses thrive by doing this for them. And we also help shape um, ATA Spec 2000. Um, we're part of the committee for the aviation industry. Um, Nervin Obando, the manager of, of the division, actually sits on the committee, uh, which actually helps design the standard in which the information is laid out on RFID tags in the aviation industry. So I ran a couple of minutes over, but I think I still saved some time for, uh, for questions. Sure. Uh, we actually use, we have several, um, but one of my favorite is uh, the Impidge reader. Uh, because of its compact size, uh, great read rate, um, and the, we've, we started off with Motorola's, first of all. Uh, that was even prior to me even coming in, that when, they, when the company first started, it, uh, first started utilizing RFID. Um, and then we, since then, we've tried pretty much everything from uh, the Motorola to the, the next one we probably tried was, um, I'm trying to think what went to after that. We, we've tried everything under the sun. And, and, and we've, the impinge readers, we've, we've had really good, good luck with. You know, no, actually, we test everything. I mean, I mean, we're somebody who we don't want to accept the fact, okay, something's working, we want to, you know, we just, we, we keep trying new technology. And also, you know, I, I don't know if it's the way you guys feel, but, you know, the last few years have been an aggressive time for RFID in general, hardware-wise, tags-wise. So there's been these just price wars going on over the last few years, and we've seen you know, this aggressive pricing changing. And that also was a factor. But was there anything that, like, did we say, oh, the Motorola readers we didn't like? No, it wasn't that. An explosion. An explosion. Literally, uh, I, you know, my side now, and again, I'm not going to pitch RFID solutions. But my side now is I'm kind of in a business development role even though I, I developed a lot of our software. But the, the interest now is that, first of all, we have two driving forces, Airbus and Boeing, right? And they are pushing, uh, I don't want to use the word pushing, that might be aggressive, but they're influencing their suppliers to get on board. And what that's doing is now empowering the airlines to take advantage of the fact that they have all these assets. To let you know, uh, Airbus's 350 program, 2, 000, around 2,500 parts are going to be RFID. So if you want to be part of the supplier program of that, 
you, you have to put RFID chips. So that is kind of pushing, but in the last, I would say, six months, an explosion in interest. Yeah. My division is. Yeah. My parent company originally just got in to improve processes. We went from the Flintstones to, you know, Star Wars in, in a couple of years. We, we do, yes. Yeah, my division does. Someone else? Yeah. So, you know, I don't have the exact numbers, but I, I can tell you that we fumbled through it in the beginning, okay? I, I, I'm just going to tell you ahead of time. The awareness for RFID when we got into it, the strength of RFID, I mean, RFID has been around for a, a while now. Most people don't know that. But still, it's still a young, young field as far as adaption rate, right? So we fumbled through it in the beginning. We didn't have anybody who was an RFID expert. We were using a consulting you know, firm. We spent a lot of money in the beginning, but then like when I came in and, and we got our own design team, we completely scrapped the original software. We've redone our, and we own all the source code to our original software. So my own point is, you're asking about ROI. I can tell you that we probably, it was probably year three before we even got ROI. Because it took three years to really get all three phases done and then get the processes going and get the buy-in from the employees too. But definitely by year three, yeah. And since we've, we've already paid for it over, you know. But for us, ROI has come in multiple shapes and sizes, right? Because it's not just been the fact internally it's saved us a ton, which it really has over the last couple of years. It's also because our clients are now choosing to do business with us because we're, we have a patented RFID life vest, right? So it's this residual benefit that you can't even write off the expenses internally of tags or your, your team just to your internal process improvements. Now we're seeing contracts influenced, and that's a, I mean, we have a 48% market share. I mean, that's huge. And that is part of the ROI. But I think when you're trying to get that executive buy-in, you really, you can't sell it just on end, you know, customer end benefit. I mean, that's all good and well. We want to improve the customer experience. But ultimately, if we can't Im internally improve what we're doing and save money, real money, and show them the numbers, then you know, that's going to be an issue. But we fumbled through it in the beginning. You know? And we probably spent some unnecessary money. The internal system? Oh, that thing's running smooth as can be. Now, literally, we, we've, we've, we don't even, the RFID division doesn't even deal with it anymore unless they want uh, changes to the, I, I can't see that. Five, okay. Um, uh, now we've turned it over to the IT team. We don't even deal with it anymore, it's that smooth now. The only issues we run into to maintain it is maybe the printer jams or RFI, the, the readers by the inspection station need reset. So standard, I, our IT deals with it. We no longer even have to have the, our, our division handle it anymore. So, but now, it wasn't like that in the beginning. Was not like that in the beginning. The biggest problem we had in the beginning was, like I said, and people don't think of this, was the adhesion jamming up the printer. We're producing thousands of vests, you know, 20 something thousand a month. Imagine, you know, you're running through that through a printer and the adhesion just a little bit one at each time coming out onto the sides and that was a huge problem jamming it up you know but it's actually now it's smooth as silk the, the process yeah so it's actually pretty impressive Right? Just to give you an idea of the life vests, um, we, I, I turned the reader down to half. I'm not exaggerating. I put it on half power. Why? Because I'll read six and seven rows back. Why? Because you're in a Coca-Cola can. 
the signal is bouncing forward. So I turn the power literally halfway back. Now to read the oxygen generators, because now you're reading through panels, you probably want to keep the power almost full, but you're still, you're going to get, you know, two, three meters easily, you know, eight, nine feet. Good distance on there. The problem we have is in first class because of the metal compartments. So now we're only getting about three feet in that, in first class. But still, you got 180 seats, you know, maybe first class takes you 45 seconds instead of 10 seconds, you know? Like retrofitting it after? Well, either way, I mean, the tag can be, uh, uh, yours the tag's embedded. Ours are internal. We have a patent on internal. So the retrofitting. But for retrofitting, we have a tag that is AS5678 approved. Not by us. Uh, we, we have a partner that we deal with um, that has uh, uh, quality 3M adhesive. Um, but, you know, is it a possibility of falling off? Absolutely. But FAA doesn't worry about you. FAA will tell you, it's in the regulations. They don't care about the lack of data, in other words, you losing the data, but they do care about um, false data. So you can, you can have the tag fall off and now re-tag it, but you can't have false data on there. And that's where in the ATA Spec 2000 for RFID, uh, for aviation, we have CRC checks. So we actually check each portion of the tag. There was another. Who's the tag supply? I'm so, who's my tag supplier? We have several, but our main one right now we're dealing with is main tag. Yeah. But um, we've actually ran the gamut. Uh, Tigo and, you know, we've, we were running Higgs chips. We were running, we, we've, we've tested a lot of chips. Xerify, I mean, there's a lot of great brands out there. Are you using uh, UHF or uh, HF? Or UHF. UHF, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Am I... I'm good? Okay, what, any last question? I think. Oh, you know, the beginning was kind of like, yeah, <laughs> there's a couple of things. Um, I think the beginning, I, I would have advised the company to bring in somebody who had greater experience with RFID. Um, we spent money, it, this gentleman asked about ROI, we could have had ROI way faster, but we spent money that just didn't have to be done. Um, but awareness is much stronger now in RFID, there's a much bigger community, and there are many more companies out there to consult. Um, I think that's a world of difference, you know. So. I'll say this also, because I think a lot of companies, there are a lot of this kind of like, you know, out of the box solutions. Nobody has an out of the box solution when it comes to RFID. That's true. And there's also out of the box consultants. I agree with you a hundred percent. Hundred percent. Absolutely. I want to thank you uh, for allowing me to speak for you today, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your show. <laughs>